How to Fix Policy 76 Regarding Lecture Issues at the University of Waterloo by Dave Tompkins. Who am I? I'm a continuing lecturer in computer science. Here is my territorial acknowledgement. I am making this video as an individual and I'm not here to represent computer science, the Faculty of Mathematics, FAO, the Lectures Committee, or the Lectures Connect website, whoever they are. My target audience includes all regular faculty, the deans, the chairs, which I'll represent as James Dean in a chair, the provost and the rest of the senior administration, and I'm specifically targeting the FRC, the Faculty Relations Committee, which sounds like it's a group of faculty members having sexy time, but that is not what the committee is about, or at least not to my knowledge. Most of my target audience knows that FRC sits in between senior admin and FAO. They've been working on revising Policy 76 for quite some time with much of the focus on lecture issues. Recently, FAO announced that things have stalled and that the FRC may need to resort to mediation or an even scarier word, arbitration. Purely as an exercise, I thought about what solution I would come up with if I was the arbitrator, and I created this video to explain it. Some of my peers might be upset because this is not a good negotiation strategy and I should be asking for something more than we expect. However, I sincerely tried to put myself in the middle and to find a solution that is objectively balanced and fair. And be forewarned, I will be saying that phrase a lot. As a baseline, I'm going to introduce what I'll call an OG professor, a regular faculty member that currently has one of the professorial ranks. I'm going to add sunglasses to help identify them. The workload for an OG professor is 40% teaching, 40% research, and 20% service. That is a workload formula used throughout academia. My focus is on teaching tasks. Typically, a teaching task is one section of one course in one term, but that's not always true. And so to keep things simple, I'll just refer to them as teaching tasks. A common rule of thumb is that the number of assigned teaching tasks per year is equal to the teaching workload divided by 10%, or one teaching task is equivalent to 10% of your workload. For our OG professor, that means that they have four teaching tasks per year, shown here as four apples. And now I present a solid model of an OG professor to use as a baseline. Now some of you are thinking not all OG professors are the same. In my unit, they have a teaching load of three and they have bigger sunglasses. Indeed, in my faculty, if an OG professor has both a grant and they supervise graduate students, they receive a minus one reduction in their teaching load. However, in my faculty, not all OG professors receive this reduction. Furthermore, I want to make it clear that my focus in this video will not be on teaching reductions. Teaching reductions vary between different faculties and units. There are inevitable differences between arts and engineering, which we can chalk up to a little bit of life's not fair. Of course, I'd hope that we'd all endeavor to ensure that fairness exists within each faculty and unit. So now that we have an OG professor model, I want to construct a model of a professor teaching stream. Their workload would consist of 80% teaching, 0% research, and 20% service. If we quite literally compare apples to apples, their teaching load will be eight. The 80-20 comes directly from the MOA. It is interesting to point out that in that same section of the MOA, it states, there is no intended linear relationship between the percent for teaching and the number of courses taught. However, my goal is to be objectively balanced and fair, and so I will continue to use this 10% rule of thumb. Now we have completed our model of a professor teaching stream. Before moving forward, I want to double back and reconsider the teaching load of OG professors and make an observation that I believe is frequently overlooked. Teaching loads are affected by sabbaticals. After six years, an OG professor is eligible for a sabbatical year in which they do not teach. This results in what I will call an effective teaching load that is lower than their official teaching load. So the OG professor on the left has an effective teaching load of 3.4, and the one on the right has an effective teaching load of 2.6. So perhaps when constructing a model for professor teaching stream, it would have been more fair to base its teaching load on the OG professor's effective teaching load. It's an interesting topic for debate, but that is not the direction I will be going in. I just want to introduce the fundamental concept of an effective teaching load, which is lower than the actual teaching load. Now that I've introduced the concept of effective teaching loads, we can talk about pedagogical and professional development terms or PPD terms. Quite frankly, I do not like that terminology. It describes what occurs during that term, but I think our focus should be on how they should be implemented logistically. 
instead of PPD terms, I'm going to call them non-teaching terms with credit or NTTCs. The ratio used for NTTCs is 5-6, which comes directly from policy 76, which states lecturers shall have the option to have at least one term in six be a non-teaching term. This statement and issues that arise from this statement are at the heart of many of the policy 76 discussions. So let's examine the impact of an NTTC on our model professor teaching stream and consider six terms of teaching tasks. Their teaching load over that two-year period would be 16, and for this example, we will distribute them as 323, 323. Because the sixth term would be a non-teaching term with credit, by definition, they would not teach in that term, and they would be credited for three teaching tasks. So while they receive credit for 16 teaching tasks, they only perform 13 teaching tasks, resulting in an effective teaching load of 6.5. If we compare our two models with the OG professor on the left and the professor teaching stream on the right, everything is balanced, including their workloads, teaching loads, and effective teaching loads. I think that if every single professor on campus conformed to one of these two models, the senior administration would be happy and this would get approved. The problem is that not all of our current lectures look like the model we have on the right. Before we examine our current state of affairs, let's consider how we arrived here. Decades ago, lectures on campus were very rare, and over time, the number of lectures has gradually increased, and a number often cited is 20%. Based on my own experiences, I think it's safe to say that not a lot of forethought went into how lectures would be structured. To borrow an analogy, lecturers were not introduced via intelligent design. Their role on campus evolved, and evolution is messy. I am not attempting to be exhaustive or comprehensive, but my understanding is that about 15 years ago, every lecturer on campus had a 60-20-20, and it was the lecturers themselves that lobbied to have the option of a 0% research component. The two natural evolutions were the 80-20 with a teaching load of eight, and the 60-40 with a larger service component and a teaching load of six. At this point, everything is still balanced and fair with respect to OG professors. Then things started to get a little bit messier. The 10% rule of thumb was being ignored, and 80-20 positions were created with a teaching load of six. I've added a broken line around that position to indicate that it is a little bit broken. I'm not saying the position in isolation is broken, but when we objectively compare it to one of the other positions, it is no longer balanced. For those less comfortable with breaking the 10% rule of thumb, there were 60-40 positions created, but without a substantial service component. I know because that was the position I was hired into. Then 60-40 positions were created that did have a substantial service component, but compared to other broken positions on campus, they were deemed unfair. So those positions were given a course reduction to reduce their teaching load. I suspect that there are many broken positions on campus that have been created over the years. And again, I'd like to emphasize that I'm only calling them broken for convenience and that they're only broken in the sense that they are out of balance with other positions or OG professors. My understanding is that many unit heads and deans are frustrated with these broken positions that they have inherited from their predecessors. I believe these broken positions are why Policy 76 discussions stalled. When they went to introduce the PPDs, they realized that it was going to introduce even more broken positions that were, quite frankly, unfair and infeasible. So how do we fix this? My solution is to just bulldoze all of these positions and start over with a clean slate. I can almost hear you scream. We have contracts and agreements. We can't throw all that away. I think we have a once in a lifetime opportunity here. With the introduction of the professor teaching stream positions, everyone will be signing new contracts and we can create positions that are objectively balanced and fair for everyone. I acknowledge that it took a while to get to this point, but I will now present my solution, which is straightforward. We will only have three core types of professor teaching streams. We will have the default or vanilla professor teaching stream with an 80-20. We would have a 60-40 with an intensive service component and a 60-20-20 with a research component. And wait for it, every single position would have a non-teaching term with credit. This solution works because all the positions are objectively balanced and fair with respect to each other and with respect to OG professors. Nobody is excluded and every regular faculty member will have an effective teaching load that is slightly less than their actual teaching load with approximately the same ratios. 
Let's take a closer look at our vanilla or default professor teaching stream with an 80-20 and a teaching load of 7.5. Our original model had a teaching load of 8, which is consistent with an 80% workload. The problem with a teaching load of 8 is the effective teaching load was 6.5, which means that over two years they'd have 13 teaching tasks. Fortunately, there has been great progress at FRC to cap the effective teaching load to be six or 12 courses over two years. And so to reach that target load of six, we need to reduce the actual teaching load to 7.5. I will concede that this is a tiny bit broken, but not egregiously so. And it is a level of brokenness that we can live with. Let's consider an example teaching load over six terms. For this example, they have a load of 3.22 in the first year and then 3.2 in the second year followed by a non-teaching term with a credit of three. The arithmetic all works out, an actual load of 7.5 and an effective load of six. The second core type of professor teaching stream would be the service intensive position. With the teaching load of six, the example is straightforward, five terms of the load of two and then a credit for two for the sixth term. And the final core type of professor teaching stream has a workload of 60, 20, 20 a retro throwback to the original lecture position with a research component. Now I have endeavored to remain objective throughout this presentation, but I will step on a personal soapbox just for a moment. I do not think that this role will be popular, but it should be available to professors teaching stream if they desire it. Having said that, I fear that the individuals who desire this role are exactly the people who should not be taking it on. I have seen some lecturers that are quite unhappy that they are not OG professors. Some are attempting to flip their current position into an OG professorship at another university, or they're trying to hack their lecture role to look like an OG professor. Please stop. When you adopt this attitude, it continues to perpetuate the stigma that lecturers are second class citizens and that we're in this rank as some kind of consolation prize. The vast majority of us are in our dream jobs and very happy to be lecturers. So who would be the right kind of person to take on this role? Obviously, anyone who wants to research pedagogy. Another good candidate would be someone whose research would have a significant impact on their teaching. Having said that, I do not think this role should be restrictive and anyone with a brilliant idea that they'd like to explore for a few years should have that opportunity. I know this particular role is a bit controversial at FRC and that it becomes complicated with respect to graduate supervision and grants. However, if I wear my imaginary arbitrator hat, my objective solution with that the rule would be available, but would require a research proposal that would need to be approved by the unit head or dean. This would ensure that expectations would be clear on both sides and ensure some quality control. Finally, to those people who do take on this role, please be aware that your research score on your annual performance report is likely to be very poor. You are gonna be compared against rock star professors in your faculty, so make sure you enter this role with your eyes wide open. I suspect that 80% of existing lectures could easily be mapped onto one of these three roles. Now I know that there are lectures with both a heavy service component and a research component, and my advice for them would be to pick a lane. The primary responsibility of any professor teaching stream should be teaching, and that component should not be diluted too much. Of course, there will be atypical roles that need to be carefully constructed by unit heads and deans. I would encourage them to keep things balanced and to not indulge with too much individual negotiation because that may lead to more problems down the road. Furthermore, as with OG professors, there will be inevitable differences between the faculties. Arts and engineering may implement things very differently, which can be again chalked up to life isn't fair. Now, speaking of that sentiment, I know there will be lectures who are frustrated by my solution. For example, if we select someone with an 80-20 and a teaching load of six, they can easily be mapped onto a vanilla professor teaching stream position. However, their effective teaching load will be the same as their prior load. And that may seem unfair to them because they did not significantly benefit from this policy change. It's human nature to feel this way and I empathize with your frustration, but my objective was not to start handing out teaching reductions. Hopefully you will take some comfort that others will benefit. And if you are a lecturer that negotiated some awesome sweet deal with your dean or unit head and you don't like what gets proposed by FRC, then I would encourage you to just remain a lecturer and don't become a professor teaching stream. Just keep the sweet deal you have 
and I think that would be the best for everyone involved. In general, every professor teaching stream should be able to choose the role that they want and have the flexibility to switch between roles as they progress throughout their career. As I mentioned, there may be some restrictions placed on research, and another issue might be that there may not be enough service tasks available. If you desire a service intensive role and there aren't enough tasks for you, I would encourage you to brainstorm with your unit head to develop new service tasks that could really benefit the university. Of course, the opposite might happen and there may not be enough demand to take on service intensive roles. I would encourage chairs to consider stipends as incentives instead of teaching reductions because teaching reductions leads to things breaking, but that is obviously situational. Just a small suggestion. I don't know why there's a tradition at Waterloo to put all of the workload details in the contract. For the professor teaching stream contracts, I would encourage the deans to use separate riders that stipulate the workload details so there's more flexibility to adjust them in the future. Over the next few slides, I will get into some of the nitty gritty on how I would codify and policy the non-teaching terms with credit. I'm happy to discuss this further with any member of FRC or the PDC. To calculate credit granted for an NTTC, simply divide the annual teaching load by three and round up. Use language similar to what is used for sabbaticals. For example, after five terms of service credit, a professor teaching stream is eligible for a non-teaching term with credit. Now, I don't love the service credit terminology, but it is used in the sabbatical section. And how the teaching load is distributed must not affect eligibility for NTTCs. For this example, I've chosen a 60-40 to make the arithmetic easier, but all these distributions should be acceptable, including having a non-teaching term without credit back-to-back -back with a non-teaching term with credit. I do want to take a moment and scold the person who wrote the language used in the December 2021 announcement. Using the number of terms of assigned teaching instead of the teaching load in policy is extremely broken, and I could probably go on a 10-minute rant about this alone please do not use this type of language. I am happy to volunteer to proofread for you. Do not force NTTCs to occur on the sixth term. Service credit must be able to be accumulated so that they can be used for an NTTC when it makes sense, both for the professor teaching stream and for the unit. If you pause this slide, it should be clear how I propose it should work. Also read the little warning. If everyone starts accumulating service credit when this policy goes into effect, it may result in everyone wanting to take their NTTCs at the same time. I suggest giving out service credit based on the number of years served to date or seniority or something like that. And the final hot topic I wanna to discuss is sabbaticals. There is a big groundswell to allow professors teaching stream to take sabbaticals. If I was the arbitrator, I would allow them and structure it so that if a term of service credit could be used either towards an NTTC or a sabbatical, but not both. Once you make the paradigm shift, you realize that there's actually very little difference between the two. In fact, sabbaticals are actually cheaper for the university because salary is paid out at 85%. For an early sabbatical, a professor teaching stream would be eligible after nine terms of service credit. They would then have two non-teaching terms and receive credit for one and a half of them. Now I've heard some people question what a professor teaching stream would do on sabbatical. And I think there's a lot of opportunities there. For me personally, I would love to spend some time in industry to make my teaching more relevant. Or maybe I'd spend some time at a sister institution and bring back ideas about how they run things and work with a colleague there to develop an, a free and open textbook. Of course, any sabbatical would have to be approved. And so there would be oversight and quality control in place. To recap, I started out with a thought experiment. What if I was the arbitrator between the senior administration and FAO? I think I came up with a plan that would actually work and that both sides could possibly live with. At the very least, I hope I gave FRC some ideas to help things move forward. Of course, my solution is based on only seeing the tip of the iceberg. I'm sure there are many nuances that I have missed. So that's a wrap everybody and it's time for my mic drop. I'm sure some of you will let me know how wrong I am. 